Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this webinar. My name is Zach Amitai. Just wanted to let everyone know we're going to take just another minute or two here to allow folks to join the room. We'll get, we'll get the program started momentarily. Good morning, everybody. Just another 30 seconds, let's say, to allow a few more stragglers to enter the Zoom call, and we will get this program started. Thank you again so much for joining us today. All right, we're gonna get started here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again so much for being here. I have the pleasure, the distinction of kicking off today's program uh, for a webinar that is entitled North Carolina's Energy Future, Understanding the Carbon Plan and What It Means. Uh, and uh, we are very, very pleased as E2 and environmental entrepreneurs to be co-hosting this webinar with our very close partners, great partners at the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster, who you'll be hearing from here momentarily. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. I also just wanna take a moment to acknowledge and thank our promotional partners for this webinar, Ceres, Chambers for Innovation and Clean Energy, the North Carolina Association for Energy Engineers, the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. Uh, goes without saying, it takes a village to pull off this kind of programming. We're really grateful for our partners uh, and their willingness to help spread the word about this event. So thank you all, and, and hopefully we have representatives from all those organizations on the line with us today. Uh, next slide, please, Michaela. So just a couple uh, items, housekeeping items, before we get started here. You all as attendees or participants have probably noticed by now you will be on listen-only mode, so your mics and videos are off. If you have a question or you want to bring your voice into the discussion, please type your questions into the Q&A box. You can access that via a button at the bottom of your screen and we will be getting to as many questions as we possibly can at the end of the program following the panel. Uh, and as a reminder, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, we'll be sure to distribute a, a, a link to that recording after the fact for folks who wanna rewatch uh, or share it with your broader network. So um, with that all being said, we'll, we'll launch the program here. And um, like I said, just very, very grateful to be hosting this conversation. We've got a really robust uh, program, a great overview provided uh, by a member of the Utilities Commission, public staff, a great panel discussion. You'll be hearing from all of them and uh, hearing about all of them shortly. But before we dive in, uh, as our co-hosting organizations, E2 and RTCC, just want to provide a little bit of background about our organization. So I'll go first on behalf of E2. Um, my name is Zach Amitai. I am the Southeast Advocate for E2, or Environmental Entrepreneurs. I wanted to share a little bit about the mission of our organization. You'll see it on the screen here. Uh, our focus is about empowering business voices to deliver the economic case for smart environmental policies. And when we say smart environmental policies, we mean policies that are good for the economy and good for the environment. And we very much believe it's not a zero sum game between those two. And we can, uh, we can implement and pass policies that are good for both. Uh, and along the way, we build a really powerful business network uh, that's nationwide. Um, and those are business voices from across the economy, across the country, who are unified in their belief that smart policies can be good for both the environment and the economy. Uh, next slide, please, Michaela. And just to reflect a little bit on that community that I referenced, you know, we've got about 10,000 business voices across the country who've engaged in our work. These are just a very, very small selection of that group, but we've got farmers on the screen here, foresters, We've got energy efficiency uh, uh, project managers. We have real estate investors. We've got uh, uh, incubator uh, incubator runners. Uh, we've got energy, uh, 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 excuse me, electric vehicle charging manufacturers and installers. We've got food manufacturers. So it's a really, really diverse community of business voices 
Uh, and we're really about providing the platform for them to engage in policy advocacy, come together, and with a unified voice call for smart policies to move us towards a sustainable future. Um, as far as the footprint, next slide, please, Michaela, and thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're nationwide. We've got nine regional chapters that are called out on this page. That means that we've got action at the state level and every single of the states that are called out here and in the areas in the Midwest, of course, it's multiple states as well as the Southeast. And all of that advocacy work also feeds into our federal policy work in DC. You'll see that's notated with a, the yellow marker, but uh, we work at both the state and federal level to push uh, sustainable policies in the climate space and the clean energy space and beyond. So we've really got it covered coast to coast. Uh, and that means that regardless of where your footprint is, as a business voice, you've got a home at E2 if you want to be engaged in our policy work. Um, next slide, please. And just to reflect a little bit more on the details of our work, it can sort of be split into four primary buckets. The first and the most important is our advocacy work. You'll see in the top left there, that's a picture from a delegation of business voices in E2 in Oregon who traveled to the state capitol to meet with policymakers and also with the governor. You'll see Kate Brown, the former governor of Oregon, is featured in the middle of that picture with an E2 delegation. But we meet with policymakers virtually in person. We organize letters for business voices to sign on to, all about trying to shape and influence policy decisions at the state and federal level. Another important bucket that we do is in the bottom right corner, our research and reports produ production. We are the authority and have been for many years on the clean energy economy, employment in the clean energy space nationwide. In North Carolina, we've partnered with the NCSEA um, on our uh, fact sheet for many years now, but that's again, just demonstrating the economic benefits of investing in clean energy and climate solutions across the country. And that's just one of the many reports that we produce. Another important bucket is our communications work. Uh, you'll see that uh, our executive director, Bob Keefe, featured on C-SPAN discussing uh, the Green Jobs and Inflation Reduction Act and his recent book about uh, the growth of the clean energy economy. But we do uh, radio uh, interviews, TV interviews, op-eds, uh, quotes and news articles. And whenever possible, we are focused on amplifying and elevating the voices of the business uh, community that we organize, uh, not of staff. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, we, we organize and host events for our community. And that's really a recognition that when we're, when we're bringing together this amazing network of business voices, we wanna provide opportunities for them to gather, to connect, because we recognize that a lot of innovation and collaboration is possible when folks are brought together. So that's just a little bit about E2's work. Uh, if you have any questions or wanna learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You'll get my contact information kind of after the fact here, but just grateful to you all for taking the time to join and learn more. And, and very grateful to be a part of this event. Uh, so with that all said, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Deb Wojcik, who's uh, the uh, executive director of RTCC, our great co-host and partner for this program. And Deb, please take it away. And sorry for uh, messing up your last name there. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Uh, I appreciate that, that generous handoff. My name is Deb Wojcik and I am pleased to serve as the executive director of the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster, or RTCC. And we have a vision of creating sustainable communities through clean tech innovation and adoption. We do that in many ways. The R and T really reflects our roots and the great strength we have here in the Triangle region. Um, and we work with industry, academia and government, other nonprofits to accelerate growth and leadership in the clean tech economy across our state. So um, we do that through investments in, uh, and support of innovation, deployment and talent in North Carolina and beyond. So from a strategic standpoint, we have three core externally facing strategic goals, business development and collaboration. This is connecting and convening, bringing together the variety of voices and creating some of those facilitated business to business connection, business to municipality in order to have those solutions in front of the people who are putting them on the ground. Innovation, both in terms of promoting and really trying to facilitate innovation of new technologies, as well as creating innovative solutions among the technologies that already exist. 
and education and talent. So education is why we're here today. We really want to bring awareness, knowledge, and bring the community together so that we can learn together and approach our uh, future in a way that brings the best available experts and knowledge together. The best part about my job is that I get to work with people who know far more than I do, and we really work to bring those voices together in a variety of ways and really invest in our events and um, with partners like our wonderful partners at E2. Talent also, we know that recruiting and retaining the talent you need is going to be absolutely critical. And we work with our membership and stakeholders in the broadest of senses to try to build that workforce that we need for both today and tomorrow. And our strength comes from the many people who are and organizations who are both members and engaged um, in our many activities. So we make sure that we are, our work is reflecting the focus areas that are most important to our uh, stakeholders, to our state at the time. So clean energy systems, this is very broadly defined on purpose. And this is where our carbon plan sits and what we're focused on today smart utility technologies and bringing all of the data we have together through um, our digital awareness and, and those technologies as well, and clean transportation, which is, for those of you here in North Carolina, know that's a huge focus right now. These are obviously all very much connected, and we are always looking to explore more and figure out where that cutting edge is. So with that, again, as Zach said, we are happy to answer questions about our TCC. Um, I really love having these types of events that bring so many aspects of our ecosystem together. And I am thrilled to move on to our program this morning. It is my great honor to introduce Warren Hicks. Warren is senior staff attorney with the North Carolina Utilities Commission. She works primarily on electric planning and rate setting proceedings, including most recently the commission's consideration of the initial carbon plan pursuant. Prior to joining the commission in July of 2021, Warren was a partner with Bailey and Dixon LLP, concentrating her private practice on representing the interests of large electric users on rate setting proceedings before the commission. With no further ado, I turn it over to Warren Hicks for her overview talk with us today. Thank you, Warren. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Deb. Um, yes, so again, I'm Warren Hicks. I'm a staff attorney with the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Um, and over the past year, I worked as part of a team of commission staff members, along with other attorneys, utilities engineers, fiscal analysts, um, and together we advised the commissioners as they were developing the initial North Carolina carbon plan. So we can move down to the next slide, please. All right, thank you. Um, so the North Carolina Utilities, Reg North Carolina Utilities Commission regulates approximately 3,000 public utilities um, three of those are investor-owned electric utilities that are located here in North Carolina, Duke, Duke Energy Carolinas, Duke Energy Progress, um, as well as Dominion Energy North Carolina. The carbon plan um, statute is only applicable to Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress. Um, but the commission's work overall encompasses a number, a number of other areas, uh, certain telephone, natural gas, uh, regulated water utilities, um, and a number of other things that you can see there on the slide. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the North Carolina Utilities Commission is a division of the Department of Commerce. We're an administrative agency, and that is our contact information along with the names of the seven commissioners that are currently serving on the commission. Next slide. Um, as I said, we have seven commissioners. The commissioners are appointed by the governor and they are subject to confirmation by the General Assembly. Our commissioners serve staggered six year terms. Next slide, please. Um, we are an administrative agency um, that is 
authorized by the North Carolina General Assembly. Our authority is limited to the scope of the statutes and to the mandates that are provided by the General Assembly. Uh, we function very similarly to a, a court. Um, we conduct formal evidentiary hearings. Uh, attorney Parties are represented by attorneys in front of the commission. Uh, we hear testimony and evidence, and then we issue orders. Um, and so I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm part of the part of uh, the commission staff. There are two significant branches of the commission staff. We have a legal division and also have a technical staff that are known as the operations division. Um, we have three attorney managers on staff and then five other staff attorneys in addition to myself. Um, our operations division has a staff of approximately eight um, and that includes utilities, engineers, and financial analysts. Um, there is another division under Commerce, the North Carolina Utilities Commission public staff, and people sometimes get commission staff and the public staff confused. We are two different independent entities where the commission staff advises um, the commissioners and helps them when they are making their decisions. The public staff represents the using and consuming public. So any consumers of Duke Energy Progress or Duke Energy Carolinas um, are, are represented by the public staff, which is an independent division. So next slide, please. Um, I wanted to give a brief overview of the House Bill 951 legislative process. The bill was initially filed on May 11th of 2021. Um, and it was entitled an act to study emerging energy generation sources, issues and trends, including advanced small modular reactors. Uh, it was a very different bill from what we wound up with at the very end of the process. Um, between May 11th, when the bill was initially uh, introduced and October 7th, when the bill was ratified by the General Assembly, um, it went through three significant rewrites in both chambers of the General Assembly, the House and the Senate, and Governor Cooper approved Session Law 2021-165, which was effective October 13th, 2021. Next slide, please. Um, and this is an example of what the caption of the final Session Law looks like. As you can see, it has a very long title. The short title is Energy Solutions for North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the final session law 2021-165 contains five parts and uh, covers a number of topics that go well beyond carbon dioxide emissions reduction. Um, the law mandating the carbon plan is contained in part one of the act and was codified at uh, North Carolina General Statute section 62-110.9. Next slide, please. Uh, so just going at a very high level as to what 62-110.9 says, it primarily directs the commission to take all reasonable steps to reduce carbon dioxide emissions originating from electric generating facilities owned or operated or operated on behalf of as well um, by Duke Energy. And those are facilities that are cited within the state of North Carolina in taking those reasonable steps to reduce carbon dioxide emissions the commission must next slide thank you uh, we have to comply with current law and practice with respect to lease cost planning for generation um, so cost was certainly a concern when the commission was developing the initial carbon plan as well as in maintain, maintaining or improving upon the adequacy and reliability of the existing grid next slide please thank you um, the General Assembly gave us two targets for emission reduction. There's an interim target, which is a 70% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. There is a second target um, of achieving carbon dioxide neutrality by 2050. Uh, the, the purchase of carbon dioxide offsets is permitted so long as they do not exceed 5% of the authorized reduction goal. Next slide, please. Um, 
subsection four of 62-110.9 does permit the commission to delay the achievement of those carbon dioxide emissions targets um, by up to two years or longer if construction of a nuclear or wind energy facility requires additional time or if delay is necessary in order to maintain the reliability of the grid. Next slide, thank you. Um, the commission also has to review the carbon plan every two years and the carbon plan, uh, development of the carbon plan has to incorporate input from stakeholders. Um, so the commission, this, as is typical with all of our proceedings, we open a docket, which you can access on our website, www.ncuc.net. Um, that first bullet is a link to the actual docket. And the docket number was for the for this past uh, carbon plan that we've issued was E100 sub 179. Um, and with the exception of confidential content, all of the carbon plan filings, filings made by Duke Energy and other parties to the proceeding, hearing transcripts, audio recordings from hearings, those are all accessible through our public docket. Um, we also live stream on YouTube all of our commission hearings. So those can be watched and streamed in real time. And they're also available, um, past hearings are available on YouTube. You could go right now and watch the, the carbon plan hearings if you were inclined to do so using that link below. Next slide, please. Um, so Duke filed their proposed carbon plan on May 16th of 2022. Next slide. Um, and just to quantify the task before the commission, uh, roughly 25% of Duke's total system, that is, uh, includes Duke Energy Progress System, Duke Energy Carolina System, and both North Carolina and South Carolina jurisdictions, 25% of the general uh, the generating capacity is coal. So we, we have a significant amount of uh, generation to replace. Um, Duke's proposed carbon plan proposed to retire the vast majority of its coal fleet. Uh, there's one unit cliffside six that is capable of operating on 100% natural gas. And so that is the exception to coal fired units that are going to be retired. Next slide, please. Um, Consistent with the statutory mandate, the commission ordered stakeholder engagement, including requiring Duke to conduct at least three stakeholder meetings. Uh, the stakeholder process spanned from January of 2022 through February of 2022. Um, and the commission also held regular sufficiency update uh, meetings where parties were, had the ability to present on the sufficiency of the stakeholder process to the commission. Uh, during that same time frame. Next slide, please. Um, we had very robust public participation in the carbon plan. Um, parties have the ability to intervene and to actively participate in commission proceedings. We had over 30 distinct intervening parties. I would contrast that with, you know, a more typical intervention group of, you know, some fewer, well, generally fewer than 10 interveners in any given proceeding. So very robust participation. Um, that included the North Carolina Utilities Commission public staff that I mentioned earlier that intervenes on behalf of the using and consuming public. The Attorney General's office is also a consumer advocate and they participate. We had advocates for commercial and large industrial customers, low income customers, and environmental justice advocates. Uh, and a, a number of other types of uh, interveners, including advocates for solar and wind developers. Um, on July 15th, we received initial comments on Duke's carbon plan and also alternative proposed carbon plans from interveners. Next slide, please. Um, between July 11th and July 28th, the commission held four in-person public witness hearings where any member of the public who was not an intervener in the proceeding could come and testify before the commission, sw offer sworn testimony that was taken into evidence um, and provide the commission with their perspective on the proposed carbon plan or alternative plans. Those were held in Durham, Wilmington, Asheville, and Charlotte. Um, on October, sorry, on October, August 23rd, 2022, the commission held remote, a remote call-in public witness hearing. There were two sessions for that. 
Um, the commission also receives consumer statements of position, and those were collected in a sub docket. Overall, we had 139 public witnesses testify, and the commission received nearly 500 consumer statements. Um, a number of interveners proposed portfolios, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to Duke, um, the public staff, the AGO, the Clean Power Suppliers Association, and the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, as well as a group known as the Tech Customers, um, the commission was presented with approximately 20 distinct portfolio options. And those differed in the timing of the carbon dioxide emissions reduction target achievement. Uh, so some of them achieved the, the 2030 target with others uh, achieving it in, in years past 2030. Um, they differed in coal retirement schedules, replacement resource mixes, and cost. Um, all of the portfolios incorporated new solar generation, and I should have also said solar paired with storage, battery storage, um, and also incorporated energy efficiency measures to achieve the interim target. There was disagreement amongst the parties on the optimal timing for offshore wind, the use of new nuclear technologies, and also um, whether new gas generation facilities should be built. Um, the cost of the proposed portfolios was generally around $100 billion in present value revenue requirement, uh, you know, give or take $10 billion at the high and low end. Next slide, please. It's important to note that on October 16th of 2022, Congress enacted the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. And that was really a, a very significant change to the landscape um, in which we were developing the carbon plan. Uh, it's gonna have significant Im impacts on the cost that Duke will incur um, and customer impacts. And so that is certainly something that's going to be uh, consider considered in the next iteration of the carbon plan. Next slide, please. So between September 13th and 29th, September 29th of 2022, the commission conducted a public hearing to receive expert witness testimony from parties. Um, that was a 13 day hearing. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, uh, one thing that is important to understand is the standard of review and that's what the commission has to look at when they are coming to a decision and a proceeding. Um, the commission's decision has to be founded upon competent material and substantial evidence upon consideration of the whole record. Next slide, please. So the commission issued our order adopting the initial carbon plan and providing direction for future planning on December 30th, 2022, also referred to as the initial carbon plan. And that uh, blue line is a link to the commission's initial carbon plan order. Um, the order was unanimously supported by all seven commissioners. We did not have any dissents. Uh, Commissioner Claude Felter authored a concurrence. Um, the commission did not approve a single preferred portfolio of generation assets for this iteration of the carbon plan. Um, excuse me. Rather, we adopted a, uh, a set of reasonable initial steps aimed at moving towards the interim target. Um, and the, the reasonable initial steps included uh, two competitive solar procurements that will include battery storage, uh, authorizing Duke to procure standalone battery storage and battery storage paired with solar generation, uh, authorizing new transmission facilities, uh, authorizing the retirement of coal generating units, uh, pumped hydro storage, uh, a wind study for offshore wind. Next slide, please. Uh, license extensions for Duke's existing nuclear fleet uh, and, and continued engagement on the potential for onshore wind generation within the state. Um, steps for the commission to consider future natural gas generation. 
um, and energy efficiency and demand side management target of 1% load reduction with an aspirational target of 1.5% load reduction, um, as well as directing Duke to continue to develop develop targeted plans for engaging with low income minority and rural, rural communities. Uh, with regard to future carbon plan processes, um, the commission has laid out a plan to um, integrate the carbon plan process with the integrated resource plan process prior to uh, the enactment of 62-110.9 the commission was responsible and continues to be responsible for developing long-term generating uh, plans, resource plans for North Carolina's regulated electric utilities. Um, we are going to be uh, consolidating those processes and it will be known as the CPIRP, CPIRP process. Um, Duke will next file its initial proposed CPIRP with the commission by September 1st of 2023. Um, the commission will issue its initial CPERP order by December 31st, 2024, and this process will continue to repeat with a new proposed CPERP being uh, filed by September 1st in odd numbered years and then orders coming by December 31st in even numbered years. Next slide, please. Um, we have a rulemaking pending. We'll see that rule being filed with the commission by April 28th of 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then just to wrap up, uh, Duke is conducting its first stakeholder meeting tomorrow. Um, and there's a link at the bottom for members of the public to register if they're interested. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, um, there is also a link where members of the public can uh, receive, receive information on future stakeholder processes from Duke. Um, and so that is the carbon plan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Warren. That is a lot to pack into this time. We appreciate you framing the conversation, giving us a sense of how the NCUC has been engaged, how your office has been engaged, and the plan overall. So with uh, that in mind, we will move on to our panel portion. I will very briefly introduce by name and title and then hand it over to our moderator to move forward with our panel. So. Today, we have the great honor and pleasure of having an esteemed panel with us, um, starting with our moderator, Miriam McCune, at, uh, who is CEO at EQ Research, LLC. We have Jennifer Baumgartner, who, Garner, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs at the US Department of Energy. Colleen Campbell, Director of Business Development at FlexGen. Luis Martinez, Director of Southeast Energy, Climate and Clean Energy Program at Natural Resources Defense Council or NRDC. Mark McIntyre, Director of Energy, Environment and Government Affairs at Duke Energy. And Ross Smith, President of the North Carolina Manufacturers Alliance. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Miriam. Thank you so much. I'm Miriam Mackeon, one of the E2 Southeast Chapter Directors and the CEO of EQ Research, a policy and market consultancy focused on clean energy and electrification. We will start with a panel discussion and then move to a Q&A session after about 40 minutes of discussion. Turning to our panelists, starting with Luis Martinez, please share a bit about yourselves and the work you do. Good morning, everyone. I'm Luis Martinez. I direct our uh, Southeast Energy work at the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, and that is mostly about trying to encourage our states to accelerate the clean energy transition to address climate change um, in a cost-effective way. Mark McIntyre. Hey, thank you, Miriam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Mark McIntyre. I work for Duke Energy in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, my background is engineering, um, environmental and civil engineering. I, um, I grew up in Latin America and came to Raleigh to, to go to NC State. Um, I started my career with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, where I was uh, an environmental regulator for about a decade, and then uh, consulting engineering 
for about seven years prior to coming to Duke in, uh, in 2012. Um, I've, I've done a number of things at the company from engineering roles to policy roles, but really my work uh, now is focused on engaging with um, government organizations, uh, NGOs, and others uh, in exploring how we can more rapidly decarbonize our sector. And again, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Ross Smith. Good morning. <clears throat> I am Ross Smith, uh, president of the North Carolina Manufacturers Alliance. I've uh, been in that position just a little bit more than a year, but that was the culmination of 38 years in uh, various positions in uh, mining, uh, chemical processing, operations, and environmental affairs. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on this panel today and look forward to being able to share some perspective from manufacturers and industry. Colleen Campbell. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Colleen Campbell. I'm Business Development Director for FlexGen, which is a leading battery storage integrator based in Durham, um, where we have our headquarters and our labs. Um, we have about six gigawatt hours installed and contracted across the entire country. And I am um, not only working for FlexGen, but I'm the past president of the Women's Energy Network Carolinas. And um, I'm a reformed engineer and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Jennifer Baumgartner. Hello everybody. And thanks so much for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. I'm Jennifer Baumgartner. I'm the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for the US Department of Energy for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs. And within our team, we are focused on helping the department uh, connect and collaborate with our congressional stakeholders, as well as our intergovernmental and external partners, which include state and local government, tribes and territories. Louise, let's start with you. What is your organization's general impression of the carbon plan? Positives, shortcomings, and any specifics you think are worth calling out? Thank you, Miriam. Um, so I work for NRDC. Uh, we're an environmental advocate group. We partnered with uh, a number of other groups to engage on the North Carolina carbon plan. Uh, I'll say that uh, in terms of a positive, this, is, this has been a long process, right? This began with the governor's executive order back in 2018. And there's been uh, sort of a series of yearly engagement stakeholder efforts to explore how to accelerate the transition to clean energy in North Carolina. Um, a, a definite positive has been the amount of interest uh, and passionate engagement in these various processes um, and the interest in additional engagement from, from many uh, who feel like they, they have a lot to say about where North Carolina should go and how that's going to impact them. Um, in terms of shortcomings, I'll say that uh, paired with all of that amazing engagement, um, when the carbon plan came out, I was expecting, our organization was expecting this to be a tangible uh, inflection point in where North Carolina was headed in terms of a significant acceleration of deployment. And we don't think that's what this is. It's sort of more a continuation of where North Carolina has been. Um, and uh, that sort of calls the question after all of this engagement, how is this really changing uh, where the state is headed? So that's, that's to me, it's a missed opportunity to really have North Carolina surge ahead as a state uh, and as our leader in our region to demonstrate this transition. Thank you. Mark McIntyre, what are your thoughts on that? Hey, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I uh, appreciate Louise's comments. You know, I think um, he and I, and, and I'm sure others uh, on, this, uh, on this call uh, were, were present from the beginning, if you will, with respect to Executive Order 80 and the development of the Clean Energy Plan. And I think it's important uh, that we, we acknowledge that in, um, in a time when, um, you know, you don't see a lot happening politically at the, 
uh, at the federal level, we collectively were able to get something done at the state level on energy policy. And I think that's a testament to the governor and his team. I think it's a testament to the General Assembly and the leadership there. Um, and I can certainly appreciate that there are, are those um, out there in the community that wanted to see something different in the carbon plan. I think from my perspective, there are really three things uh, that, are, that are positive that I just wanna shine a light on. The first is um, the embracing of this iterative idea, right? I think we see that borne out um, in the carbon plan. And, and I think it's important that this work be iterative because we know that we live in really uncertain times. There's a lot going on geopolitically. Um, we've seen uh, fuel price volatility. Uh, there, there are supply chain challenges. And so locking North Carolina into a single portfolio um, seven years prior to a, a 2030 uh, carbon reduction goal might not have been the most productive uh, productive outcome. Um, and again, largely because of the uncertainty that we live in. So the iterative process, I think, is tremendous. Uh, the second thing that I think is really important is the Utilities Commission's carbon plan acknowledges the role of fuel diversity. Uh, North Carolina enjoys electricity prices that are significantly less than many other places in the country. And, and I think historically, we have enjoyed those low electricity rates predominantly because of our embracing of fuel diversity. We don't necessarily put all of our eggs in, in a single uh, fuel basket, if you will. So that diversity and that embracing of diversity is a hedge against all of that uncertainty that we're experiencing right now. And then the third thing that I think is, is really a triumph of the carbon plan is the acknowledgement of the role of transmission investment. Um, you know, it's easy for us in the energy side of the business to, to talk about the transition of generation. Uh, but honestly, when we were having many of those clean energy plan conversations um, years ago, the question of transmission kept coming up. And I think seeing the Utilities Commission embrace this notion that in order for us to more rapidly transition the sector, we've got to focus on transmission investments, I think is important. Um, so those are three things uh, that I think are, um, I think, productive outcomes of the carbon plan. Certainly, the fact that we'll be filing an update in September, and, and as Warren suggested, there's this iterative process. Um, it's really, really important that uh, we embrace that iterative nature uh, so that we can um, check and adjust as, as we're making progress toward 2030. Thank you. Ross Smith, uh, what does your organization think about the carbon plan, positive shortcomings, and any specifics you think are worth calling out? Thank you, Miriam. And uh, thank you, Mark, for your, your comments and Warren's uh, introduction. Um, I thought that uh, several of those points do, do hit home and, and make some sense for us as manufacturers uh, in our, in our process. Uh, we certainly want to be making wise decisions and so maybe that is reasonable initial steps with uh, no selection of a single preferred portfolio. But let me take it a little different direction. Uh, one of the most important takeaways for us is the commission's emphasis on reliability. Demonstrated through the commission's authorization for new gas, moderate increases in solar, and an insistence on having new generation in place and functioning properly before the carbon generation is taken offline to, to replace and then retire. And in that replace, making sure that uh, everything has been done to make sure that those, that the new units are reliable uh, because we certainly uh, I can't take that risk of, of failure of the, of the new systems. Uh, the commissioner's re remarks about how the Christmas Eve blackouts underscored the need for an orderly measurable transition. Certainly we do need to have that orderly and measurable transition. Not saying that one blackout event makes a reputation because certainly it, it does not, uh, but it does uh, underscore the, the need for attention in that area. And, and finally, that the commission's explicit instructions to do that they better doggedly pursue every cost cutting measure possible to apply downward pressure on rates. And that's gonna be very important going forward. Uh, 
as we've heard, we're, we're looking at a hundred billion dollars here and, and there's, there's likely to be other expenses in addition to that. So we've got to uh, look for those cost cutting measures uh, so that we can remain cost competitive uh, in the Southeast, across the nation, and even globally uh, for our manufacturers and industry. Thank you. And finally, Colleen Campbell, uh, what does FlexGen have to say about the carbon plan? Well, any any plan that um, calls out for battery storage or for that plan, right? Um, I think it's interesting to note a few words that were used that kind of describe battery storage, uh, reliable, resilient, help with grid resiliency, um, where we're installing quite a few at substations in on other um, for other clients, um, transmission deferral costs and capacity. So I think I think the uh, the value of battery storage is probably shown in this, um, and it it helps North Carolina, which is probably I'm looking at the American Clean Power quarterly report for 2022 that was just published last week. And so North Carolina is still uh, probably top 15 in in installations from from last quarter. Um, so it keeps them in that in that uh, range. Thank you. Uh, just a friendly reminder for the audience, if you'd like to participate in the Q&A session in a few moments, um, about 30 minutes from now, please just go ahead and submit your questions now through the Q&A button. So, uh, Mr. Luis Martinez, does the carbon plan have North Carolina on the glide path to meeting the carbon reduction mandates established in law by 2021's HB 951? Um, I'll say that we are in danger of not meeting the 70% reduction by 2030. Um, and that is because of a uh, potential deployment of additional fossil infrastructure. And um, I mean, we are trying to deal with the problem of carbon emission from burning of fossil fuels. So it, it just seemed very strange that one of the solutions in the carbon plan was to build yet more fossil fuel. Seemed like, you know, you're dealing with lung cancer and a prescription was to go buy more cigarettes. Um, but uh, part of the issue is, you know, the, the North Carolina currently has an issue securing sufficient gas. Um, gas is certainly lower emission than coal, but uh, as we saw during the, uh, the holidays, uh, there's not a sufficient gas without building additional pipeline, which would be very expensive and disruptive to those who, uh, who live in communities through which that uh, additional pipeline will have to be deployed. Um, and, you know, we have a concern about, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Smith was talking about reliability in these era of extremes. There's an issue with baseload resources not being reliable um, because there's uh, these gas pipes, pipelines are freezing uh, nuclear or when it's too hot, nuclear generation can operate. Um, but mostly we were concerned that there was not sufficient deployment of renewable energy uh, to get us on a track to achieving the 2030 goal. So we're concerned that we might not meet the goals uh, we've all been working for. Thank you. A question for Jennifer Bumgarner. We're on the cusp of implementation of unprecedented levels of federal investments in clean energy, thanks in large part to the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA. Can you reflect on a few specific programs within the IRA, I IJA that can help North Carolina to meet its power sector decarbonization goals while benefiting the local economy? Absolutely. Thanks for that question, Miriam. And, and I'll just say, you know, I love this question in part because uh, like many of the folks who I think are listening and participating on the panel, um, 
I spent many years of my career focused on state and local opportunities to really advance carbon reductions while we all waited to see what the federal government might do. And so the good news is that we are in a moment where there's really unprecedented federal action and support for carbon reductions. And, and so um, just to speak to a few of those that I think are particularly relevant on the DOE side, um, I will just flag that we are now one year into um, what we call the Building a Better Grid initiative. That is uh, an administration-wide initiative that is focused on how we really shore up and advance the critical infrastructure that we all know we need for a low carbon economy going forward. Um, and in particular, you know, some of the funding opportunities um, as a part of that initiative have already rolled out. Um, but there, I would note that there is uh, Section 401D, which is formula funding for states and tribes. North Carolina is eligible for a little more than $9.2 million in FY 22 and 23 under that pot. Um, there is also currently um, an RFI for a series of transmission siting and economic development grants that is a total of $760 million in investment under the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'd encourage folks who really are focused on the transmission and grid piece to, to really take a look at that RFI and use this as an opportunity to give input. Um, because I do think that the grid and transmission pieces are gonna be really critical for how we move forward. You know, in addition, I will just flag that, that DOE is currently in the pro process of working with a number of our federal partners um, around the home energy rebate programs that were authorized uh, in the IRA. Um, that's nearly $9 billion worth of funding for home energy efficiency and electrification programs, which is really a huge opportunity. Um, DOE will be setting guidance for those programs, but states will be administering them. So there is some opportunity, I think, for states to really be strategic and prioritize. And, and North Carolina, um, I'm proud to say, has a history of excelling with these kinds of programs. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity. Um, the other thing I'll just flag is, you know, from a, again, from a formula funding perspective, um, there is a, a new uh, energy efficiency revolving loan fund capitalization opportunity. Um, North Carolina's share of that is 2.3 million. I think that's a great opportunity for really, again, thinking about partnerships and synergies and how we leverage those funding. Um, the state also has uh, a significant bump in its state energy plan funding. Um, so 10.4 million in 2022, plus a regular allocation of about a million dollars um, and $6 million in weatherization funding for the same year. And these tend to be funds that, that hit very close to the ground um, in communities and with um, local and small businesses. And so I think they're a really important part of the equation. But I'll just close, you know, obviously that is the, the briefest scratch of the surface in terms of what's available in, uh, in IIJA and IRA. So I would just say for anybody who wants to know more, we are happy to be a resource, but you can also go to energy.gov slash BIL for bipartisan infrastructure law, and you will find there a great resource of all DOE programs. Um, it's got a place where you can sign up for updates. It has a lot of additional information, webinars, and other things you can join. But most importantly, it has, actually has a tracker of every single funding opportunity for both pieces of legislation that will be coming out of the Department of Energy. That's clickable, so it will take you directly to whatever information and resources is available. And it also provides um, a quick link to any kind of due dates and timelines that are relevant for those programs. So um, we've only hit a few things here, but that's a great place to go and learn more. Great, thank you. What are actions, Jennifer, uh, that are key to North Carolina to taking full advantage of clean energy federal funding in the IRA, IIJA? Absolutely. I think there, there are three things that I would lift up, um, none of which will be a surprise, I think, to folks on this call, but they're nonetheless important. Um, you know, one is planning. So as we all know, there are a tremendous number of resources from DOE, from EPA, from other federal agencies. It, it is really kind of an unprecedented funding moment. The number one question that we really hear from states and local communities um, as we're working with our intergovernmental stakeholders is how do we prioritize, right? How do we find the things that are the best fit? And how do we think about where we can stack these funding opportunities and really take maximum advantage? So my first advice to any states and communities who come to us is to say, you know, the first step is really planning and it's prioritization and really trying to take a step back and identify the things 
that the state wants to focus on and, and that are going to be the top priorities. Obviously, there may be funding opportunities below that top tier that you still want to pursue, but those are going to be the ones that you really want to zero in on and, and I think, you know, take the time to really um, focus on. The other thing I will just say is that if you look across the funding for Bill and uh, Ira, um, you will see that there are a tremendous number of different entities who are eligible for different programs, right? From nonprofits to state energy offices, um, to local communities, to utilities, to private businesses. And so coordination and communication and collaboration is really, really important. And I think a way for a state broadly to maximize its ability to benefit from these funding is really to bring those stakeholders together and really think about where there are synergies and where there are opportunities to leverage the maximum benefit for North Carolinians. Um, so that one is really important. And then the final one that I, that I really want to highlight um, is the intersection with equity and justice and how you plan for that. And so many people on this call will have heard of Justice 40. That's the administration's initiative that says that 40% of the benefits of uh, programs and funding should go to traditionally to historically disadvantaged communities. In DOE, we take that very seriously. We have more than 125 programs that are covered by Justice 40. And for many of those programs, one of the ways that we are ensuring that Justice 40 is a really meaningful part of the way we manage these funds is to have a part of the application be a, what we call a community benefits agreement. And so this is really a way to look at the key components of, of equity, justice, and access and embody those in the application. And that's a scorable part of the application. So when people ask, what can we do to improve our chances? One of my first answers is give us a really good community benefits plan because it's typically 20% of the total overall score. So it really does make a difference and that will carry through um, for the life of the application. Once an award is made, we will be following through on that plan as part of compliance. So I would just say, you know, plan, coordinate, and be really thoughtful about how an application that is submitted addresses this question of justice and equity and access, because we will be looking at that carefully. And it's really, really important for how we move forward together with a clean energy future. Thank you. On the topic of state and federal integration and coordination of policies, uh, Mark McIntyre, please uh, tell us a little bit about what you think um, regarding the, the carbon plan order, which requires Duke to remodel resource additions, including impacts from those clean energy investments in the Federal Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law. And it's requiring Duke to file a new proposal with the commission by September. So what do you expect will be different in that proposal? Well, thanks for that. Um, I'll try to make this as brief as possible, given given the time. I really appreciate, Jennifer, your remarks uh, and having DOE represented because we are spending, as a company, a tremendous amount of effort um, thinking about how we can utilize the bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA to buy down the cost of the energy transition in North Carolina. And it really is an historic opportunity for us and for so many others across the state and the nation. So. Um, you know, thanks, huge thanks to DOE for, for all the guidance. I know that it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work for you folks uh, and certainly a tremendous amount of work for the folks like us who are trying to figure it out. Um, in terms of, of the next iteration of the carbon plan, you know, I'm not a, I am not a, a power sector modeler, uh, but my understanding of, of IRA and IIJA in particular are that, you know, from a from an IIJA perspective, we're really thinking about it more on the grid side, and um, you know maybe some uh, opportunities for for other things like um, battery storage research and hydroelectric generation. But really, I think from a modeling perspective, likely what you'll see is the inclusion of production uh, tax credits that are in IRA um, to really help us understand sort of on a, on a price parity and reliability perspective, how do uh, other resources fit into the mix? And I, I do think that it's important, you know, Warren in her opening remarks did highlight that, you know, the carbon plan wasn't just about carbon, right? It's also about affordability and reliability, importantly. And so the modeling that you'll see, of course, um, is, is going to be looking at a, a carbon target, but the, certainly the expectation of the Utilities Commission that any modeling that 
that we provide and, and that they vet and perhaps do themselves will also um, keep a keen eye on reliability of the system and affordability to customers. Um, you know, we hear routinely from, from many residential customers that they can't afford a penny more on their electric bill. And we certainly know that um, North Carolina is um, a state that lots of companies want to come and do business in. And, you know, a key component to do, doing business in North Carolina is electricity costs. So we want to make sure that, um, that we're doing everything we can to take full advantage of IRA and IIJA to buy down that cost of, of the, um, the transition. Ross, uh, what do the Manufacturers Alliance member companies need from North Carolina's electric grid? Well, it may sound like repetition, but I think reliability is going to come up here in just a moment. Um, reliable, high quality electrical power. And lots of times when we talk about durations, we talk about 24 7, 365. Well, for many of the complex manufacturing processes, uh, that are that are sensitive to that power in influence and influx is is very important. So we're not just talking about 24 hours a day. We need to come down to 60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour. That reliability has got to be consistent, and the quality of the power has to be consistent as well. And then just to, to double back on what Mark said about um, cost competitiveness. Uh, the, the rates that, that are paid and have got to be uh, allow the industry and the manufacturers to be able to compete uh, on a southeastern regional basis or a national basis, but really globally, so many of them uh, are in competition uh, around the globe. So delivering high quality electricity to manufacturers and industry and, and keeping the lights on for all the customers must remain the top priorities for our growing state. Now we, we've got to ensure that any generation and resource changes maintain or improve the adequacy and the reliability of, of the grid. Um, a voltage sag that's just a mere seconds for some of our manufacturers can be uh, super critical and they can end up tripping off uh, one of the processes. And then that brings more and more complexity to it when you have to consider um, the, the product process that in midstream, the, the process goes down, well, is, can we recycle that or do we have to uh, waste that? Uh, all those are, are considerations that we have uh, when we've got a, a dip in the uh, electrical quality uh, that's being provided to us. The, the importance of reliability and power quality, they, they just can't be understated. And uh, I, I know that, that Duke is, is very sensitive to this in the conversations that we've had with them, uh, but I think it's important for all of us to understand how reliability uh, can impact uh, the performance of individual uh, companies, individual processes, or statewide. Thank you. A question for Colleen Campbell of FlexGen. As you know, the carbon plan directs Duke Energy to procure 1,000 megawatts of standalone battery storage and 600 megawatts of battery storage paired with solar generation in the near term. How do you expect this to impact the battery storage industry in North Carolina? I think it's a, it's a great improvement of what's there. We're supporting um, NCEMC. We've just commissioned some of the 10 sites for them, I, I, if you don't mind, I feel like Ross's answer teed me up just a little bit for uh, what batteries do. Um, so I just wanted to just say, um, there is something in Texas called the fast frequency response and FFRA, and it's we're doing upgrades right now for 200 milliseconds. So um, Ross, I feel like uh, maybe we should talk about battery storage backup for your for your clients as well. Um, re reliability is kind of at the forefront of, of what batteries are capable of doing. But yeah, we have, right now we have North Carolina um, just a, a bit in our pipeline. Um, our overall pipeline grew about 20 gigawatt hours since the passing of the IRA. 
so um, significant impact in our business and um, and cost was definitely what the IRA did for for the battery storage market and making it a solvable um, solution set for solving problems such as Black Start or any anything else. Excellent. Uh, question for Jennifer Bumgarner. Can you reflect on the findings from the Duke Energy Carbon-Free Resource Integration Study conducted by DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory? What were the study's key takeaways? Thanks, Miriam. I'm, I'm happy to, um, with the caveat that I am definitely not uh, a technical expert in the way that our NREL colleagues are technical experts, but I think there are a few highlights that are particularly relevant for this group. And just, you know, for everybody's awareness, this is actually a two part study. And so I think the findings come in, in the second part and they're really, uh, there are five key findings, but I'll just say, I think, you know, the first two, the first three um, are, are really ones that I think it's worth taking note on, right? So the first finding was that Duke Energy can meet the 2030 emissions targets in North Carolina through investments in a combination of solar PV, wind, and energy storing storage, um, along with maintaining the existing nuclear fleet. So there, um, at least in NREL's view, you know, there is a clear roadmap there that relies on resources that I think um, the state has had a lot of interest in, and some really good experience in deploying. The second finding looks a little further out. Um, so looking to a zero carbon emissions electricity sector in 2050, um, they found that this could be achieved through investments in solar PV, battery energy storage, um, maintaining the existing nuclear fleet, uh, land-based and offshore wind, and uh, procuring other zero carbon resources. So there is a 2030 path. There is also a 2050 path. And then the, the third finding maybe that I would highlight, um, because again, I think it, it really fits in with the, the tone and the focus of this uh, conversation, is that um, investments in new transmission and in the opportunity to do exchange with neighbors is going to play a really important role in achieving both the 2030 target as well as the you know the 2050 net zero target. So it really, I think, highlights uh, the need to be thinking about this. You know, certainly from a North Carolina context, but also from a from a broader context. There are other findings that we could definitely delve into, and, and I'd encourage people to take a look at the report. Um, if you haven't, there's a lot of richness there, but I think those are three that really are helpful for the conversation we're in today. Thank you. For Luis Martinez, NRDC was part of a group of interveners in the carbon plan docket that submitted their own proposal based on modeling they commissioned. What were a couple of the major differences between NRDC's proposal and the carbon plan order? Thanks, Miriam. Um, so uh, yeah, like I had mentioned before, we partnered with a number of groups, including SEL, the Southern Environmental Law Center, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, the Sierra Club, uh, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, um, hired Synapse, worked with RMI, um, and I'm missing one of our consultants. Anyway, we, we sort of had a fleet of, of help uh, and resources, and we were looking at how to achieve the goals by 2030 and by 2050. And what our uh, plan, what our modeling demonstrated is that it could be achieved both 2030 and 2050 goals um, by 2030, we were looking at reductions from Duke's, uh, uh, the, the Duke version of the plan that achieved the goals, um, re reductions in the cost by up to 7%. Um, our plan did not call for any additional new gas by 2030, uh, significant additional solar and battery deployment. So about seven and a half gigawatts of solar by 2030 and five and a half gigawatts of battery storage by 2030 as well. Um, and we were particularly looking to increase the amount of energy efficiency deployed uh, to about one and a half percent of the total retail load, which I know became sort of an aspirational goal. Uh, I was hoping it wasn't aspirational and just the, the actual uh, mandate, but that is a key driver to reducing the cost uh, of and the amount that needs to be done to transition. Um, and finally, to sort of coincide with what Jennifer were say, was saying, uh, we, were, we also looked at the uh, availability or the importance, the opportunity to purchase renewables uh, and 
uh, move them into the state from large distances, so regional interconnection, participating in regional markets, and what that could do to reduce the cost of, of achieving these goals, which is significant. Frankly, if you want to, uh, we're you know everybody I think is very concerned and rightly rightfully so about reliability. Um, and as we're entering this phase of extremes, having very integrated grids that can move, deploy resources across great distances, hopefully greater than some of these uh, uh, you know, weather events that are happening so we can tap into them, maintain the reliability, it's gonna become more and more important. Um, so that being said, those are, those are some of the, the differences with what our plan called for. Um, and, and to agree with Mark, uh, I think it, it is important to have this sort of iterative, uh, I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but every, every two year look into uh, the plan and sort of we were looking into what could be investments in the next two years that would be no regrets. Um, and we thought efficiency, renewables, uh, particularly solar and battery storage, deploying significant amounts of all three of those uh, are gonna be no regrets. Wonderful. Um, a question for Mark McIntyre. Duke Energy has cited interconnection constraints as a major limiting factor in how much new solar can be procured in the coming years. What is Duke doing or planning to do to remove or at least reduce these interconnection constraints and can federal funding help? Yeah, great question. Um, first, yeah, Louise, I think you said it well when, when you said that we, we need a, a resilient grid that can really manage uh, our systems across the spans of events that we experience. I think it's important in that context for all of us to acknowledge that North Carolina is now a winter peaking state. There was a time when we experienced our peak electricity demand in the summer, but uh, we generally experience our peak demand before the sun comes up in, in winter. And so while solar resources certainly will provide for uh, support to that peak once the sun comes up and those, those units are generating, um, we're really relying on other resources um, prior to sunrise. And so it highlights how important batteries will be, but it also really shines a light on the need for transmission. And when you think about, um, about constraints on the, the energy system, really uh, grid congestion as a consequence of high concentration of intermittent energy and not enough transmission resources. So one of the things that the carbon plan does is it directs us to execute on a series of transmission investments, particularly those in Eastern North Carolina. So there was a time not that long ago when 60% of, of the largest um, utility scale solar projects in the country were being developed in Eastern North Carolina, east of I-95. And so you're developing lots of utility scale solar, but you're doing so in rural areas away from load centers. And that by, by the very nature of that development created this congestion issue uh, and capacity constraints on that system. And so the Utilities Commission uh, and their vision of, of transmission investments really, I think, are the, the maybe the biggest uh, opportunity we have to alleviate a lot of those constraints in the, in the near term. And, you know, I, I agree with Louise. I mean, we restressed the importance of, of no regrets actions. And I think that's borne out in the carbon plan, significant investments in solar, significant investments in, in batteries. And then as I noted, significant opportunities to invest in transmission. Thank you. We have several audience questions, so let's get right to it. Someone asked, should there be a different plan to regulate methane emissions as the carbon plan primarily focuses on CO2, and methane is shown to be a more potent greenhouse gas. So anyone want to take that? So Miriam, I, I, I don't know that I can speak to whether or not there ought to be a separate plan. What I can tell you, you know, the way that I, I know that there were a number of stakeholders that would have liked the carbon plan to essentially address carbon equivalents, right? But the way that the law was was drafted and ultimately signed by the governor, it was exclusive to carbon dioxide. And so the plan that the Utilities Commission issued was thus exclusive to carbon dioxide. I can tell you that um, that's certainly not to say that Duke Energy doesn't have aspirations outside of carbon. 
carbon dioxide rather. Um, you know, we have a, a net zero methane emissions goal. Um, we are, are doing a tremendous amount of work on particularly gas pipelines to make sure that uh, we've got leak detection systems installed and that those systems are robust and generally leak free. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say necessarily whether or not and who would ultimately have purview over a, a methane reduction plan. Uh, the carbon plan, by definition in the law, was exclusive to carbon dioxide, uh, but we take all emissions seriously. We have now net zero goals on all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. So, um, so while the carbon plan certainly is focused on, on carbon dioxide, we're focused on, on methane outside of that context. Thank you. And I should point out uh, some questions have already been answered in the Q&A area of the chat. So um, we're just going to answer the ones that have not been. What are panelists' reflections on the position that the portfolio providing for interim compliance by 2030 is not only the most expensive, but also the one posing the greatest threat to reliability? Maybe I can jump on that one first. Um, I mean, we, we do have a concern that investing in further gas uh, will land us in a situation like we have right now where there's a lot of coal generation that is not economic uh, that we're having to retire and pay for still um, as ratepayers. Um, we think uh, additional gas generation. We think some of the existing gas generation will probably need to be taken offline um, before it's fully paid for uh, and require uh, ratepayers to foot that bill. Um, and, and we think there should have been, uh, and we'll continue to push this, a much more significant focus on energy efficiency to reduce the challenge overall, reduce the cost uh, of these investments. And as IRA and IIJA, uh, the, the repercussions of those inve federal investments um, work their way through the economy. We think the opportunity for significant deployment of renewables in particular and um, other carbon reducing technologies uh, will allow, uh, sh should allow us to refocus uh, the, the current carbon plan in the next phase. Thank you. And Luis, I think it's important that we look at uh, some of the terminology that was, that's been included in the control plan, that implementation of the carbon plan must adhere to the least cost planning principles and achievement of the goals by 2030 is not required at any cost. Rather, the law requires these goals to be accomplished at least cost. And the, and the qualifier is to take all reasonable steps to reach those goals. I, I agree with that, absolutely. And our, our version of the plan had cost savings over the current version, um, which is why I'm wondering why it's not where we're at, but uh, we'll continue to push for those. Colleen, uh, can you reflect on how battery storage has the capacity to solve solar's intermittency issues? And how does battery storage, battery plus storage compare cost-wise to traditional firm energy sources like coal or natural gas? probably not the best person to ask about comparing to alternative fuels because it's been a while since I've been in the gas game, but um, it's pretty inexpensive with the IRA. I mean, it's probably comparable, but um, the smart people from from those owners, engineers, companies can can probably share better costs. But, but I will say, um, tell me, tell me the first part of your question again, because I wanted to answer it. Sure. Uh, please reflect on how battery storage has the capacity to solve solar's intermittency oh. issues. Okay. Yeah. Use cases. So yeah, for sure. And, and offshore wind, right. For part of North Carolina, um, definitely being able to store for four hours plus a discharge at a time of use when, um, when there's a, a need that um, maybe exceeds the current capacity. There's a lot of different use cases for battery storage. The, the one thing, so the IRA decoupled the need to get the energy from solar. 
So what you're seeing now is more standalone storage by itself. But that doesn't mean that it's not useful with storage. I think there are a number of developers who are putting storage on, on all of their solar plants. Um, a number of developers who are putting storage on all their gas facilities. Um, it's a great, and coal plants have a lot of space, good, good interconnects at coal plants to put batteries at coal plants. Um, we have a thousand megawatt um, MSA with uh, who was one of the largest coal produce, producing uh, generators in the Midwest, and and now they're they're putting batteries there. So, um, and those plants, I mean, they're newly some of them are newly built too. Um, it's a very very useful tool. Um, hopefully, I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, someone said, as a homeowner in North Carolina, I'd like to participate in solar and battery storage efforts to increase personal and community energy reliability. However, North Carolina doesn't currently allow PPAs or leases of equipment at the residential level. Is there anything within the plan to help reduce financial barriers? Um, I recommend going to North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association's website and looking at their solar guide because there are some possible leases you can do and they have a consumer guide on that. So NCSEA, uh, look for that uh, solar guide, energync.org. Next question, on, perhaps. On the, on the financial barriers, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act should help with those. Uh, on the legal or regulatory barriers, those need to be addressed. Uh, the next question is uh, perhaps for Luis or Mark, is uh, the current one megawatt per commercial electric account regulatory limit severely limits large energy users from independently achieving net zero energy. For example, there are dozens of large campuses in Research Triangle Park many of whom with the open available space to install appropriate renewable to energy capacity, yet none of us can exceed that one megawatt limit. What can be done to remove or substantially increase this limit? Okay, I see that was answered in the chat actually. Uh, any other comments on that? Great. Um, and uh, I think our uh, Duke Energy colleague has had some technical difficulties, so um, we cannot ask uh, Duke Energy specific questions right now. Um, but it, uh, yeah, I, I think an interesting question for Ross um, is, as we move towards a clean grid, how does the Manufacturers Alliance see our state's manufacturing industries benefiting from that transition? Thank you, Miriam. Um, the transition is going to put an emphasis and a spotlight on, on the critical importance, again, of reliability and power quality more than ever before. But one of the other things that, that we may see is that those companies that have ESG go goals, the environmental, social, and governance goals, they may be able to make progress in, in their pathway and, and even towards achieving a cleaner, cleaner supply chain. So it may actually provide us some side benefits that, from, that, uh, we, that we might not have considered in the past. But if we keep the focus on an orderly, moderate, and measured pace of the energy transition, we'll be able to make progress towards uh, carbon emission reductions while ensuring that we maintain or improve reliability and continue to have affordable electric rates in North Carolina, which can bring success to all of us. Great. I, I see that um, our Duke Energy colleague is on the phone. Can you hear us, Mark? Okay. Um, all right. Well, so it is uh, about time for the last question. Um, so we will ask 
Colleen, um, how do you expect federal investments from the IRA and IIJ to impact North Carolina's battery storage industry and the clean energy economy as a whole going forward? Yeah, the, the costs are significantly um, um, deferred by, by the IRA. And then if you could have, if we can have a few more folks move to the uh, U.S. and create those um, wonderful um, factories to have U.S. made modules, then we'll, we'll be even higher on the percentages. But, um, and, and those developers who are developing in the economic disadvantage get that more percent. I mean, it's, it's really incredible what this legislation has done. Um, you know, there is no capacity market or ancillary services market like there is in Texas um, and, and other markets. So it's, uh, it's different in the Southeast as everyone knows, um, but all positive. Thank you so much panelists. Um, and uh, we'll turn it back to Zach. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miriam, for moderating. Panelists, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and your perspective to the discussion. Very, very clearly, uh, uh, um, you know, an incredibly important and multifaceted topic. We could probably spend another hour and a half, if not more, discussing the ins and outs of this. I also want to acknowledge that while we did, uh, you know, make great efforts to include different perspectives in this panel discussion, there wasn't enough space to include all perspectives and all stakeholders in this very important proceeding. Uh, so just want to acknowledge that uh, we did our best to include voices, but uh, certainly encourage everyone to you know, pursue other avenues to hear from other voices on the merits and potential shortcomings of, of the carbon plan process and the order itself. But you know, wonderful to hear all our panelists just reflect on the direction that we're headed uh, uh, you know, in an aggregate as a state. We're moving towards a clean future. The question is in the details, how we'll move in that direction, how quickly what technologies we want to try and leverage to, to expedite that transition, but to ensure reliability and affordability. These are difficult questions with no clear answers, but we're certainly working hard as a coalition, as a community, to move us in the right direction as quickly as can, given the rising costs of unmitigated climate change. So just want to thank again all our panelists for being part of this discussion. Very, very beneficial to have you all in the same virtual room. And I just want to encourage Everyone on the line, please find a way to get involved in these discussions going forth. You heard from all the panelists, there's a lot of work remaining here in the regulatory space, in the state legis legislative space, in the implementation of federal funding space to make progress here. And we do hope that you all find a way to add your voice to the discussions and, and move us towards the clean future that we all want to achieve. So with that all being said, thank you all so much. We hope we got to as many questions uh, as uh, well, we got to as many questions as we could. Sorry if we left some unanswered, uh, but please keep an eye out for follow up uh, from the organizing organizations. And please do keep in touch and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you again, everyone.